What is going on? It's Alex coming back at you with another video. And today we have yet another amazing collaborative mock graph with my friend Garrett from Football Analysis. Feel free to introduce yourself. Yeah, what's up? How we doing? Um, appreciative that he's uh, Hail Mary's allowing me on the channel and uh, we're going to get right to it. And uh, I have the odds. He has the evens. Might be a little trade you can see on the screen that we'll discuss shortly. But uh, with the first overall pick, I think this is pretty simple. Uh, Justin Fields was traded to the Steelers for a reason. I think this pick was made as soon as Carolina confirmed or as soon as it was confirmed that Carolina had the number one overall pick. No surprise. It is Caleb Williams from USC. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, Caleb, obviously, one of the best quarterback talents that I've graded in my time of studying the draft. Uh, pick number two, Washington Commanders. I'm going to be selecting Drake May here. There's a lot of rumors that it's going to be Jaden. Like, a lot of rumors. I know. I, I saw that face. You're like, damn it, I wanted to get Drake. Um, a lot of rumors are saying that it might be Jaden. I just highly doubt it. I think that it is almost a smokescreen for teams that might want to move up for Drake May. <clears throat> like your Vikings. Um, so I'm going to be selecting Drake. The ceiling's simply higher. I like the floor on Jaden a little bit more, but I trust Drake's durability as well, given the tackle situation significantly more than someone who's a little bit more injury prone in Jaden Daniels. So with, with the Vikings on the clock, um, we are, of course, going to be selecting Jaden Daniels. I think if it came down to Jaden versus JJ, I just think there's a lot more to like in Jaden's game. Um, not only that, but Jaden or any quarterback that goes to Minnesota in the first round because they didn't make the they didn't make the trade with the Texans to sit at 11 and 23 and hope that one falls to them. But uh, the reality is, is they're entering a phenomenal situation. There's a good quarterback coach in Josh McCown. There's a good head coach in Kevin O'Connell. There's a good running back in Aaron Jones. There's a pretty good receiver. You might have heard of him by the name of Justin Jefferson, uh, number two receiver in Jordan Addison. TJ Hawkinson eventually coming off the knee injury. And then, of course, both tackles in Christian, Dar excuse me, Christian Darisol and Brian O'Neill. So mm -hmm. I can convince myself as a Vikings fan that no matter which prospect we take, which of course is Jaden Daniels here, I can convince myself that any of them are going to succeed just because of the situation they're walking into. I would, of course, prefer Drake May, uh, but Jaden Daniels is, of course, nothing to scoff at here. So Jaden Daniels going to the Vikings and hopefully with the LSU connection that uh, that extension with Justin Jefferson would get done. Dude, I love the LSU extension right there. Uh, yeah, Jaden Daniels going to Minnesota. The trade was 11-23 and then a 25-1. So Patriots incentivized to move back, a team that just simply also is not fully ready to bring in a quarterback like Jaden Daniels with the amount of holes that they have on their roster. At pick four for the Arizona Cardinals, rumored to want to move out of this selection. I am not going to because I'm going to do what's right for Arizona and just get one of the most consistent, reliable, high floor receivers for a team that just needs to hit on a true number one receiver. That is Marvin Harrison Jr. A lot of teams love Malik Neighbors just as much, but Marvin Harrison Jr. I think fits the role that I want for Arizona just a little bit better. So I, I love that selection, by the way. But with the Chargers on the clock, I wouldn't mind taking Joe Alt uh, mm -hmm. just because, I mean, it helps out the offensive line. But that receiving room is is pretty bare right now. I, I hope Quentin Johnson can turn it around. But after you trade Keenan Allen and after releasing Mike Williams, I know Jim Harbaugh is not a you know a, a guy that wants to throw the ball 70% of the time, but you have a franchise quarterback at Justin Herbert, and as good as Justin is and as much as I love Justin Herbert, I mean, we got to do something for him. Give him a premium position for a guy that's on a rookie contract, uh, a guy that is a lot of teams receiver ones in the draft, and even over Marvin Harrison Jr., and I think Malik Neighbors would be a great selection for the Chargers at five, especially after everything that the Chargers have done this offseason question for you so i'm curious about this if you were debating between marvin harrison jr and malik neighbors for the uh for the chargers who do you think would give them the best chance of success i mean i think both like i think it's it's great. six i think it's six of one half dozen or another um i i know that's like a, a cop out but to actually to answer the question and not just say that I would probably say Marv just because he does. I mean, there, there's no weaknesses in Marv's game. The, the weaknesses are hilarious. It's yeah. that he doesn't have elite yak or, or something like, or his speed is is good or even great, but it's not 
Uh, it's not Xavier worthy speed. It's just, yeah. I, I, there's, there's no, there's no knock in Marv's game. If, if Marv doesn't go into a thousand yards as a rookie barring injury or barring quarterback injury, I would be pretty surprised. So I would say Marv, but Malik neighbors to me is probably the third best receiving prospect in the past 10 years behind only Marv and Jamar Chase. They're, they're both oh. elite prospects. Hmm. I mean, I love Malik Neighbors, so I'm perfectly fine with that. I haven't obviously studied the draft for the past 10 years, so, uh, you know, it's uh, interesting. Like, the first year I really got into it was that Jamar Chase year where I had a full grading scale and everything, and yes, I agree. Jamar Chase is still my draft darling in terms of the highest graded receiver of all time, but at pick number six for the New York Giants, I want to blend a little bit more realism in here, and I think that the New York Giants... When you look at what's really handicapping them, they don't have a number one receiver. I like Darius Slayton quite a bit, to be fair. Uh, Romo Dunze could be a really, really good option here, but it's the quarterback. I know that Danny Dimes is on a relatively not great to move off of contract, so don't move off of him. Let him play half a year and get Daniel Jones with an upgraded arm in J.J. McCarthy. Uh, you know He has that mobility aspect that you already have built into the offense. He needs a little bit more mentorship and development. He also is rumored to be a guaranteed top six pick, which of course, smokes green season balls to the wall, but I'm going to be going JJ here because the potential is that you're getting almost a floor of Daniel Jones with a much higher ceiling. And that's how you can win in this division. That's an interesting pick. I, when I, when I've been in this situation, this, this mock, I, I tend to go Rome to the giants uh, yeah. just because they need I mean, number one. Yeah, Darius Slayton's been the leading receiver for them in four of the past five or four of his five NFL seasons. And the only year that he wasn't was 2021, in which Kenny Galladay was their leading receiver. So it's been a tough go of it for uh for Big Blue over the past five years. But right. with Tennessee on the clock here, I think this is really aside from Caleb at one and Marv at four if he's there. I think this is just a sprint in. We don't care about any other trade offers. Um, and I think it's Joe Alt. I, I've mocked Joe Alt to the Titans several times now. And if, and if he's there, I don't think the Titans should even listen to any offers. I mean, you have to protect Will Levis. You have to give your guy a chance. Andre Dillard was a disaster last year. Jalen Duncan, they tried. Uh, he was a sixth round pick from Maryland. Just get your left tackle for, for the next eight to 10 years. Don't think about it and have Alt and Skaronsky and go from there. I'm curious, where do you think left tackle ranks in terms of positional value? Like which one, like obviously quarterbacks, the highest valued position, but you know, would you value left tackle as the next most valuable position? Assuming a quarterback is right-handed. I, I would honestly, I hate to say this. I would say it depends. It, it depends per team. Um, I would probably rank left tackle too, though, just because mm -hmm. I mean, like Will Levis last year, there were times where he didn't stand a chance. I mean, he did not, it, it didn't matter if, if Justin Jefferson was on the team, Tyreek Hill was on the team, there was no, he wasn't going to be able to get the ball out to him because Andre Dillard and Jalen Duncan at times were, were that yeah. poor. They, they played that poor. Um, so I would say that, that all left tackle is second most, if, if it is that bad, it's that noticeable. And, and it was for the Titans in 2023. So um, I think a, I got to word this, a good tackle versus a bad tackle makes much more of a difference than a good receiver versus a bad receiver. Totally agree. So um, I'll talk to you about that a little bit more, but essentially similar for offensive line and for corners, I have a similar mindset where like compared to wide receiver, I'm willing to pass on wide receiver because if you have one massive hole at wide receiver, you can ignore it a lot easier than if you have a vacancy at tackle or at corner because the team, the opposition is obviously going to take full advantage of it. But I'm going to take an edge rusher here just for the sake of time, go after Dallas Turner for the Atlanta Falcons and get the Byron Young for Raheem Morris there, 447 speed, just pretty much, in my opinion, 10% worse than Will Anderson, but obviously a little bit different style of player. Needs a little bit of mentorship. I personally would also go and try to target Hassan Reddick with one of your late day two slash early day three picks to get some good mentorship there. I love it. I love the pick. And I think that's, I mean, that's got to be another sprint into the podium. At least that's how I would feel the Falcons need pass rush in the worst way. But this selection is tough. Mm -hmm. I am personally under the belief that after failing Justin Fields from day one, that we're going to do everything we can to ensure Caleb doesn't fail. Yeah, we have DJ Moore. Yeah, we have Keenan Allen, but Keenan's a little old and mm -hmm. 
you know, who's not old Roma Dunze. And if you can have a trio and run 11 personnel with DJ Moore, with Keenan Allen, Roma Dunze, and have Cole Komet, who I think is a kind of underrated tight end. I think that's a selection that the bears would, I mean, they go crazy if they had Roma Dunze. My, if I had to have a backup selection there, I would definitely go pass rush. And I, I, if I had to go, I'd go Jared verse. That's not a bad consolation prize at all, but Roma Dunze would be my pick to Chicago and walk out of the first round with a quarterback and receiver, both on a rookie deal for the next four years. I dig it. What do you think though, in case you ended up going after an edge rusher and verse there, do you, a, think that it's going to be likely that Brennan Rice would be there at that third round pick. And then B, do you think that'd be interesting to get, you know, obviously not the exact same testing, but close enough, especially for that difference in pick value and then get that chemistry as well. I, I mean, I, I get what you're saying. Like with, the, I think Brendan Rice would definitely be there. Um, yep. I think there, I also think there'd be better receivers there. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Xavier Worthy's not going to be there just because of the 40. He'll be, I think he'll be slightly overdrafted, but it wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if someone like Jalen McMillan's there, maybe Tez Walker. I think there will be a, at least a guy that should go in the top 60 picks will be there. So I don't think Brendan Rice would be the, the best receiver available when they're on the clock at, at pick, no. I would say 75, but no, I'd rather rather go Rome, get get your quarterback and receiver. And uh, you have two guys that are 26 years old or younger. DJ Moore is 26 this year. Yeah, that, that'll just be there for Caleb for the next, you know, five, six years. So I, I love Great. that pairing. And uh, that'd be a pretty nasty offense. It would. So at pick number 10 for the New York Jets, uh, they've obviously solidified their tackles for with short term guys. Moses as well as Smith. Both of those guys are getting up there in age as well. Smith definitely has his issues in terms of injury. And one of the things that I've talked about extensively with, you know, with y'all as well as uh, many other creators is the fact that, you know, you could go after a receiving weapon here, pair him up with Mike Williams, get Brock Bowers. Like that's obviously a great way to, you know, improve the firepower, give Aaron Rodgers his best shot in terms of overall weaponry to push for a Super Bowl. But the thing that scares the crap out of me the most is having one of the backup tackles, whether that's Max Mitchell or the kid from Pitt. Uh, you know, I don't, Carter Warren, I don't really want either of them starting or having to kick AVT to tackle and having a massive vacancy on the offensive line. Like for me, I want to be able to have somebody who can start day one, but is able to back up the offensive tackles because they're just extremely unreliable. I'd rather have a healthy offensive line going into the playoffs trying to make a push for a Super Bowl and having to make more out of less in the receiving core than make more out of less out of the offensive line. So I'm actually going to go for a crazy pick here in Tali Fawaga, who can play guard in the short run, but also has the ability to be a superstar tackle in the long. I love this selection. And I just, I think it's, I mean, with Tyron Smith's injury history with Morgan Moses being 34, I, I actually tweeted this right after they signed the, right after they signed Tyron, I, I said that, uh, offensive tackle still has to be on the board for them at pick 10. There's no getting off it. And we saw that last year they had a couple injuries, not just Aaron Rodgers, but all across the board. Um, so I do love that selection. Now with the Patriots here at pick 11, their offense is honestly one of, one of the worst in football. Like not just one position. It is all around bad. I mean, yeah, they have Mike and Wainu, but it's, it's collectively just a, a, a bad unit. So I think what we have to do here, I think this prospect is a little overthought. I think he is still a very, very good player. And that guy is Olu Fashanu from Penn State. I, I don't want to, I don't think he's a blue chip talent, but I think he is a very, very good tackle prospect. And I think he'll be fine in the long run. Remember, he's just 21 years old. He's going to mature. He's going to get stronger as his career goes on. And I think his tape was all around very good. You know, we're talking about a few reps against Ohio State. And now all of a sudden we're knocking this guy down, you know, close to half a round. So mm -hmm. I think Olu's fine. And I think especially because you got to remember the Patriots aren't going to compete this year. They're not going from three wins to, to 13 in one year. They're, they're, they're not. And I think everyone can acknowledge that. So if we get a guy that can gradually grow as we grow as a team, I like the pairing with Olu quite a bit. But before you select at pick 12, I, I want to ask, okay. I want to propose, propose a trade here. I want to see if okay. you're interested. Let's hear it. Um, I, of course, have the team or have the, the odds rather. Okay. And I'm interested in hearing if you are willing to go down from pick 12 to pick 19 to trade with the Rams, in which I would be offering 19 and 52 to come up. Ooh. And I would be asking for, uh, I would say, 147 in return. And of course, 12. You know what? I've never done a trade with the Rams. 
I like it. Let's do right. it. So 1952 for 12 and you said 145? I, was, I said 147, but if, if you're feeling generous, we'll take 145. Let's be generous today. Okay. All right. All right. Sounds good. I've, I'm, I'm intrigued. Okay. So I'm going to allow you to pick for the Rams then in okay. that yep. instance, and I will end up still selecting for um, the Broncos at 19. Okay. So this, I was actually, I spoiler, I have a Rams video coming out very soon. I was deep diving into their roster and everything. Um, obviously they had a pretty good player retire recently. And the initial thought process would be, let's just go ahead and try and replace Aaron Donald with either Byron or, or Johnny Newton. But I think we're at a point where the Rams need to worry about protecting a guy that's had a lengthy injury history in Matt Stafford. And I really love Troy Fatanu from Washington. And I think that four of their five uh, offensive line spots would be, they'd, they'd be solidified. You'd have Troy, you'd have Jonah Jackson, you'd have Steve Avia moving from guard to center. And then of course you'd have Kevin Dotson who just signed a big deal as well. So that immediately to me, would be one of the premier offensive lines in all of football. I'm not saying it's the best, of course, but when you can have that offensive line and then have Kyron Williams run behind that offensive line, and I think even later in the draft, the Rams will select a running back uh, to pair with Kyron Williams. I like the Rams offense a lot, and I think that there's a chance they could, I don't want to say play bully ball, but there's a chance they could you know, control the ball for 33, 34 minutes of a game and keep their defense on the field almost as little as they need to. And also, as we know, the Rams uh, love trading first round picks. They do. They do. Okay, so you still have pick number 13 as well with Vegas. So I do. I'll, and have, there was, I'll have my three run, and then you'll have there, your three run. There was, there was a reason that I traded up in, in front of Vegas, and that's uh, – because I think there's a chance that they go offensive line. I think Antonio Pierce is trying to build something similar to what the Lions uh, and, and Dan Campbell and Brad Holmes have in Detroit, where I think they you know, want to zig while – or what is it? They want to zag while everyone else zigs, if you will. Right. You know, you have the Mahomes, Allens, Burrow, Strouds, Lamars. You have everybody in that conference. But, you know, the Raiders have kind of always been an outlier, and they've always – you know, in a good way, by the way. They, you know, they do their own thing. They – you know, kind of kick ass and take the kick, kick rear end, take names later. I don't know if you want to crop that out, but anyway, no, you're good. You um, can, you can say whatever you want. On this okay. Show. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, so I still think they're going to go tackle and yeah. I love the idea of going Amarius Mims to the Raiders just because I think Amarius is, uh, he's a big, nasty mauler. And I know we had limited tape at Georgia, but there's a reason he's being, you know, talked about as high as he is. And uh, that was another reason why I wanted to move up with the Rams, because I think there's a very real chance that we have a tackle run go from like 10 to 15. And I think there's a chance that the Rams miss out on that tackle run. Wow. I mean, hey, I'm an offensive tackle guy. So this just makes me smile. This puts a smile on my face. Um, at pick 14 with the New Orleans Saints, another team that technically could even try to address offensive tackle. I want to propose a trade here. The okay. Saints have traded with this team before in the past. I'm going to try to trade with the Philadelphia Eagles. Ooh. And um, the Eagles well, right been. now, they're pretty. So this is something I've discussed quite a bit. Um, the trade would be 22 and 53 for 14. Maybe you can squeeze <laughs> out one of the later picks. Later. like Yeah, like 190 or something like that. Or actually, you know what? For the sake of it, let's give Philly back their 199. Are you fine with that trade? Uh, you have you have 22, so this is actually all you. I, I know. I know. We're, we're doing the video. I would like it. Yeah, I would like it, though. I would like it. Yeah, I would okay. like it. I think, it's, I think it's fair. Yeah, I think Saints can then get back a little bit more draft capital since they don't have a third round pick. I don't even think they have a fourth round pick either. So um, they get a little bit more value. And then the Eagles move up because the Eagles have the best backup corner core in the NFL. But if you want to win a Super Bowl, you're going to be facing an all pro, if not pro bowl wide receivers. And this team does not have a single pro bowl corner left on its roster. You have veteran guys who are great mentors, but they're shells of themselves back when they were all pro slash pro bowl corners. And if you stick Keely Ringo and Eli Ricks versus Brandon Ayuk again in that NFC championship game, it's over. It is. You cannot, this team is not built properly without one of the corners genuinely being an all pro corner. And the fact that Terry and Arnold has slot versatility means that even if you want to keep you know, Darius Slay out there. Even if you want to keep Isaiah Rogers as a pure boundary, you can still have Terry and play every single down. And the fact that he was a former five-star safety means that you can see in his run support ability, he's going to help out in the run support. And he is extremely smart, cerebrally smart. My number three player in the class, you know, he's to me reminds me very similarly in the processing realm of Joey Porter Jr. last year, just a smaller frame. 
I love I love Terry on and I love the idea of him going to Philly. I just think in terms of a a prospect to a city just just clash. I, I don't know if there's a better one in the draft, but mm. um with with the Colts at pick 15, there is parts of me that wants to go either Quinion or Cooper DeGene, but uh, we are going to do everything we can to help out Anthony Richardson. Shane Steichen, of course, comes from Philly. Uh, and Shane Steichen, you know, saw Dallas Goddard play pretty well in the Super Bowl against the Chiefs. Uh, I think that tight end is, is pretty will be pretty emphasized for the Colts in 2024 and beyond. And you also have to remember that Brock Bowers, like in terms of a receiving prospect, I think you can argue that he'd be you know, like the third or fourth best in the class, maybe behind Rome, maybe above whoever your wide receiver for is, maybe a guy like Brian Thomas Jr. Right. So if you can have Brock Bowers, uh, if you can have Michael Pittman, you can have Josh Downs, of course, AR, and then Jonathan Taylor. I like that a lot for the Colts moving forward, and I think they can address corner, hopefully get a guy like TJ Tampa in the second round. Absolutely. This corner class is super loaded as well. There's only a few teams in this draft that I think need to get a little bit aggressive because they just need to get better on the top end of their corner core rather than the bottom end, and the Eagles were one of those. Uh, so I have Seattle here at pick 16. This would be a great spot for a trade out as well because of the fact that Quinion's on the board, but I mean, unless you want to trade up with, because I'm kind of ballsy with the Packers, because I always say like, hell, Quinion Mitchell with that defensive system would be great. Um, I'll stick and pick, but that's up to you. I'm I'm good. I'm I'm Brian Gutkist. I'm I'm good. I'm good. I'm gonna let it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let it go. I'm gonna let it slide. I don't let think he's slide. going quite yet. All right. So uh, we're gonna be passing on that. Seahawks are going to stay put. And of course, I'm so used to seeing Fautanu or Fautanu on the board at the moment, and that is just not the case. So it's an interesting spot to be in for this franchise. I actually think that you go best player available. That's the best way to like keep the Seahawks extremely competitive. Obviously, you're at a point where you know you're weirdly in a situation where Geno Smith still has to be a supreme version of Geno. At worst, you have Sam Howell. That doesn't seem to be Super Bowl ready for me. So I'm going to go after the best player on the board because I don't want them continuing to fall. And this edge class has some good talents in it. But Jared Verse to me is worth a top 15 selection. It should be a top 15 lock. So I'm going to be going after that talent because I just think sometimes you just got to get the best player. I don't hate that at all. I actually like the pick quite a bit. I uh, For Jacksonville, this is tough. Because there, there's two players I, I'm looking at, both on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, I think we're at a point in the Trevor Lawrence era. I've said this a bunch where I'm a little worried. I, I, I'm a little worried. Uh, I don't think Trevor has earned a, a $275 million contract like you know Burrow and Herbert and all those guys just got paid. So they signed Mitch Morse in free agency. If they didn't, I would love to give them Jackson Powers Johnson. But we're at a point where it's like, okay, you know, we lost Calvin Ridley to a division rival you know we didn't just lose him we lost him to a division rival uh we have christian kirk on the squad we have gabe davis who i'm admittedly not a fan of gabe davis so i'm going to select brian thomas jr and essentially say trevor we're doing everything we can to help you buddy figure it out and uh hopefully this works out because if not then there's a chance that we get fired because we're not uh we're not winning enough so we're going to do everything we can i think brian thomas jr is a very very good receiving prospect and uh, he would be the pick for me. All right. Yeah, no, Brian Thomas is almost can't miss at pick 17. His He actually, so I don't know if you have an analytical grading skill for your, um, for your players, but for me, I do. And there was just something about Brian that didn't factor in to my actual grading system that like I actually ended up adding an it factor category or an ain't factor, so to speak. Uh, basically allowing myself to slightly tweak for eye test or for like lack of motor and it was because I saw something with Brian that my school, my grading system just didn't show me. So, um, no, a big fan of Brian Thomas and his future in the NFL. So 18, technically I have 18, 19 and 20 via that trade. Mm. So we're going to go on a quick little run here. Bengals. I'm not going to play around too much. I'm going to be just getting as much help as I can. They have like the lowest RAS score average for their offensive tackles in a pretty damn athletic division. Plus Trent Brown doesn't really, uh, get me too excited if I'm going to be completely blunt. I'm going to replace Jonah Williams, who was a Bama right or Bama left tackle, with a JC Latham, who's a Bama right tackle. And I'm not going to think about it too much. He's a talented tackle. You have anything to say on that? 
No, I'm honestly just eager to see where you go here because I, I know what I would do, but I'm I'm eager to see what the pick is. See, the thing is, my heartstrings pull me to Quinion Mitchell because I have a fantasy of having Pat Sertan times Quinion Mitchell because that sounds ridiculous. Mm. At the same time, you don't always play like what is the most awesome outcome when you need to also build a multi-billion dollar franchise. Uh, I think that there is a particular position this team is going to try to target. They already got that second round pick back from LA. And if they end up wanting to bolster the corner position, this class luckily is relatively deep at that position. I could go a wide receiver route, but I think I'm going to go the more realistic route in terms of rebuilding your franchise. They don't have anything at quarterback. And I actually like Bonex. I think he gets a little bit too much flack for him just being a maybe not spectacular and not jaw dropping player, but a really solid game manager who has, you know, that arm upside and just has a good mobility. I mean, he's ascended every year of his career. He seems like a good guy in the locker room. I think that it's the more likely selection that Bo would be a primary target for them at 19. And I like that pick a lot. Bo is Bo has really climbed up my he's climbed he's climbed for me recently. I, I like him a lot. I released a, a quarterback video today and I discussed that within the video. I think Bo is check it out. I kind of underrated. I think he's kind of underrated in terms of where we are with the media. Everybody wants to talk JJ McCarthy, you know, JJ Zach Wilson, JJ's whatever, which that whole discussion, you can, you can find a tweet saying JJ's the next Patrick Mahomes. You can find yep. him saying that he's the next Jamarcus Russell, but um, now I think Bo Nix is kind of just going under the radar. I, I like him a lot. There's not a lot that he doesn't do that. I think, wouldn't translate to the NFL. And I think he's kind of a sleeper as crazy as that sounds. And yep. uh, I also think that this was part of my reasoning for, for proposing the trade back at, at pick 12 was if once, once the top guys are gone, like that, once the four in the top six are gone, I, I really think that both Bo Nix and Michael Penix, I think there's a chance that each kind of free fall a bit. Sure. Sure. So essentially you were saying that your plan would be wait for 51 essentially to see if one of them gets there or, like let them fall to pick 19. Oh, no, just let, let them fall to pick 19 because I right, think once, right. once, once we get out of the top six or seven picks, there, <laughs> there's maybe one or two spots in the first round. And, and then you kind of be hoping that somebody trades up in the back half. So once, once we're out of the, you know, the initial, you know, couple picks, I think it's just, all right, guys, like, thanks for coming. We'll see you either at the end of the first round or, or on day two. And it's uh, right. Bo Nix, I think is the best chance to go to Denver at, at this okay. point. So is that your plan? I was seeing if were we on the same page? Yes. Yep. Okay. Got it. Cool. Yeah. Cause when you traded back, that's what I did. I've actually traded back. I, th I think it was with the Eagles. Um, I traded back with them so the Eagles could actually move up for Terry and Arnold in one of my more recent mock drafts. So they could also move back and still select Bo Nix and get really good value that way. Uh, pick 20. I'm still on the board with the Steelers. Do I just go mayhem here? Cause I'm not seeing I mean, I could easily go Jackson Powers Johnson. I've heard a lot of rumors that NFL offices aren't very high on JPJ. Also could try to, you know, finesse a solid center later on. You also have a, you know, bona fide experienced signal caller at the helm. So you don't need an offensive center to call out packages and everything like that. So I think the value of a center right now is a little bit lower than what Steelers fans want to admit. And I know we traded away Deontay Johnson. It's really tough to pass on Quinn and Mitchell at this point. Dante Jackson essentially is our ticket to get DJ off the team and then have a future setup. So to me, it's Quinion Mitchell or AD Mitchell. We're going to get a Mitchell. AD Mitchell to me reminds me a little bit too much of the skill set of George Pickens. You know, somebody who has really surefire hands, great release package, um, underrated pretty much in the majority of categories, but he tested out the way George Pickens plays on the field. I'm going to throw a big curveball. I'm going to go Quinion Mitchell because I don't think the Steelers would ever plan on him ever falling to this point because, you know, the ball skills are ridiculous. I think he needs a year under someone like Dante Jackson who has that speed and experience. And that to me is worth a little bit more than the potential of a day one receiver. I like it a lot. And I, I was hoping, I was hoping like, I didn't, I didn't know where, I didn't know where the plane was going through that journey. Yeah. I was hoping it would land, but that's where it would land. Now I love, love okay. Quinion to, uh, to Pittsburgh. And I think Mike Tomlin would, would, love him from day one he's just oh, yeah. just a to the standards the standard great football player I, I don't think there's much to uh to think here now i'm back up dolphins on the clock 
I th- I want to go JPJ. Uh, I'm also looking at Graham Barton. I think that's kind of right. where I am right here. I, I think the selection has to be O line. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think both are good players. I, you know what? I'm I'm not gonna. I I know you can make the argument that with you know how fast everything is in Miami, that you know you don't want a 340 pound center just in terms of you know the scheme and 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 everybody flying around. But I'm gonna go Jax Powers Johnson. I'm not gonna overthink him. He's a good football player. He is one of my favorite players in the class. Yeah. And honestly, a lot of mocks I do, JPJ usually isn't there for Miami. Mm-hmm. And the thing is that also needs to be remembered is Tua needs a lot of protection up front. Obviously, Tua is not Lamar Jackson back there. And if we can keep Tua, you know, if we can keep him upright, let's go ahead and do that. So let's protect our franchise quarterback and help the offensive line in a big way. And I love JPJ to the Dolphins. I should have fact checked this, but one of my subs ended up saying that Jackson Powers Johnson actually grew up a Dolphins fan too. Really? So I think that's almost a match made in heaven. Uh, pick 22 for the New Orleans Saints. This is via that trade back with Philly. You know, I think this team still could be looking at their future offensive tackle developing Tyler Guyton. But to me, that gives me the EBGBs of you're developing another very aggressive offensive tackle that might not be ready to step on the field and perform day one. So I don't think that they also are going to have the, let's just say humility to admit that Trevor Penning was an absolute you know, shank yeah. of a pick. I think this team is either going to look at defensive line. You got Byron Murphy here. And after Aaron Donald said he played at like 260 to 285, you know, maybe the undersized comment, if the talent is there, not necessarily as valid as what we thought could go Cooper to Gene, because that secondary has guys who are potentially trade candidates as well as just getting old. Uh, and then you could just put them anywhere on the field or, I think this team is still lacking a true number one wide receiver outside of Chris Olave, someone who has that size, who has that frame that you could just YOLO the ball to. And I think that that is a little bit, you can find some guys down the board, absolutely. But I think there's something a little bit more special about going after A.D. Mitchell at this point, because I trust some guys down the board for defensive interior for the Saints. And I just don't know if I could find an A.D. Mitchell. That was actually who I was going to take for New England. Not yeah, uh, <laughs> my bad, bro. <laughs> yeah. um, this is tough, though. This is this is a tough decision because we obviously yeah. went with Olu back at pick eleven. Right. Uh, I wanted to go AD here. AD with the Patriots offense would be electric. It would just it would it would help out a lot of uh, it would help out a lot. Yeah. I I still think the Patriots. I still think their roster is offensively it's it's pretty bad i think their defense is is fine that really threw me for a loop here uh i don't i don't want to go lad <laughs> mcconkey at 23 i, I don't want to do yeah. that and i don't want to go jatavian sanders at, at pick 23 i think it's a little early for troy franklin i wouldn't hate double dipping along the offensive line i did this in a mock mm-hmm. not too long ago patriots fans were kind of annoyed with me but uh, you know what? It's it's your comment section. We're going Graham Barton, and Graham Barton <laughs> Graham Barton has the versatility to play anywhere along the offensive line. So, uh, Graham Barton reminds me a lot of Elijah Vera Tucker mentioned mm-hmm. earlier in the video. Uh, he Elijah can play anywhere, and I think Graham can and will play anywhere. So, we have a guy go down. Perfect. We can just slide Grant right in, or Graham right in rather, mm-hmm. and we have. Uh, three of three really good offensive linemen, Olu, Graham Barton, and Mike and Wainu. And this draft is extremely deep at the receiver position. So while while we wouldn't be getting an AD Mitchell in the second round, uh, we would still be getting a, a quality player. And even if we wanted to double dip and go receiver again in the third round, I think that would be a good uh, process for New England, you know, and to just get the offense back to a competent level rather than a historically awful offense. So uh, we're going Graham Barton to pick 23. I love the extra analysis, living up to the football analysis name. I know I I usually go drone on and on, so I'm glad that somebody else can provide equal amounts of commentary because it's always nice, especially like when you have those videos where somebody's a little bit more succinct. It's like, ah, I'm talking 95% of the time. So really do love the commentary right there. Pick 24 for the Dallas Cowboys. My dream pick was Graham Barton. Ah, so. I guess we both got each other on that one. Uh, I think that the Cowboys could be in a very interesting position here in terms of having to address offensive line. Their center, as well as technically their left tackle or left guard spot, I assume Tyler Smith, who was drafted with the term tackle, should be 
come their left tackle. I literally have him at 18 on my board back in 2022, listed as a guard eventual left tackle, and I think he's ready. That being said, I still look at some players here at the tackle position, and I love what they can bring to the table. One of those is Jordan Morgan, who I don't think is going to be the left tackle. I think that we're going to kick Tyler to left tackle. And we're putting Morgan to left guard. I don't see any centers that are worth this selection here, in my honest opinion. I think Jordan Morgan, when I evalu evaluated him, and I'm pretty confident on my tackle to guard evaluations, I thought he could be a Pro Bowl level guard at the very minimum. I have a lot of faith in what he can bring to this offense. Great mobility. Um, just honestly, very polished for what he can do on the interior of the offensive line. And I thought that he needed a little bit more patience, but actually performed a lot better when he knew somebody was next to him. And that's a big trait that I look for when I look for guys who need to kick to the interior. Jordan Morgan is going to be my guy. I like it. And I was also, I, I love Tyler Smith as a prospect a couple years ago coming out of yeah. Tulsa. I, uh, I was way higher on Tyler Smith than I was Trevor Penning. Um, oh, yeah. And that honestly annoyed me when the Saints took Penning. But mm -hmm. anyway, uh, Green Bay is on the clock. This is, uh, I mean, it, it's chalk, but he, dude, he's staring you right in the face. Just get, give me Cooper DeGene. We're not overthinking it. Cooper, Jair, uh, Xavier McKinney. Just it, it, there's, there's not a lot that needs to be said here. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. Right. Just, right. Give, me, just give me Cooper. Yeah. Um, the Cardinals are actually having a kick-ass draft because we're having a massive need position for them mm -hmm. slip right here with some incredible value, which apparently is the rumor of the town that the de defensive interiors can slip. Uh, but the Buccaneers at pick 26, it's hard to think that look, the weird thing is we have a lot of pretty solid edge rushing talent in this class, but we've had so many years of good edge rushing talent. Not many teams are actually desperate for a true edge rusher anymore. Would you agree with that? Like, oh, yeah, I think I think I would agree with that. Yeah. So that's why we can see players like Leotu Lawtu, who, you know, they bring some almost an Aiden Hutchinson level of presence with their technicality and you know, better from a two point stance and just a little bit more cerebrally smart than, you know, you randomly see him slip to 26 rather than going in the top 10 because there's just a little bit less of a demand for him. I think this team can't pass on it. They're going to try to be remain competitive. And the best way to do that is to get someone who can get off blocks and, you know, have that athleticism to get past the block rather than just have to engage in it. And that's exactly what they did in the first round last year with Kalijah Kansi. He was a gap jumper. And he did a phenomenal job. So they're going to try to have lightning strike twice with layout two law two. I, I love it. And I was hoping you would make that pick that, I mean, lots of lots of to the bucks to me. It's just like, it's a, it's a slam dunk, both, both sides win. Um, I, I do want to propose a little bit of a trade. I'm going to see, uh, uh, we're just testing the waters here. We're just, picking we're up the just phone. testing. We're, right. Yeah. We're, we're picking up the phone. Um, I'm calling Eric to at at pick 30. Uh, and I am seeing if you will give me 30 and 93 for pick 27. I'm, I'm just, Ooh. I'm gauging interest. And if you say no, that's completely fine. 30 and 93 for pick. Yeah. We'll get another yeah. top 100. We'll get another top 100. And, yeah. uh, you guys go, go up and get a guy. Would yeah. With that? I am a hundred percent fine with that. All right, cool, 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 cool. Um, I'm honestly thinking about it through the Cardinals point of view more than yep. anything. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, because, I, I like it. Yep. Yep. That's because uh, I assume like, did you have a plan for Baltimore? Let me put it that way. Yes, I did. I did. I'm going okay. to elect you to choose your plan for Baltimore. For my plan point. for Baltimore. Okay. Here's my plan. Uh, we are Baltimore loves Baltimore loves Alabama football players. This dates back to Ozzie Newsom being an Alabama guy. I think this is a player that's been a little over. Yep, you already know where I'm going. Yep, it's 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 pretty simple. Kool Aid to me is going to be a good pro. He's a very very good player. Uh, I also think that Baltimore or not. Well, this this let me think where, how to word this. This obviously relates to Baltimore, but I, I think Marlon Humphrey's downfall is is coming. Marlins played around a hundred career NFL games. Not that I'm, I'm banking on it. I don't want to take pride in a player, you know, downfalling. I just think that's part of the business part of his position that once you lose that lateral quickness as a corner, it's, it's downhill because it's on tape for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, bringing a, another guy from Alabama. I think Marlon could take Kool-Aid under his wing. I think Kool-Aid out uh, the opposite side of Brandon Stevens, I think makes a lot of sense. And Baltimore usually drafts a year early and I wouldn't hate Baltimore going offensive line, but uh, I think Kool-Aid to Baltimore makes a lot of sense. Kool-Aid's awesome. And honestly, he'd be gone probably at pick 29 as exactly. well. That's, that's also, yep. That was also why I was thinking of. Yep. So that's, yep. 
<laughs> See, we're thinking ahead. I, yep. that, that's what's good. Like you can just essentially project what's going to happen. Um, pick number 28 for the Buffalo Bills. This is one of my less favorite selections. I'll just admit I'm not a fan of selecting for the Bills because at this point, I think the wide receiver talent is relatively tapped out for what I'd want for the Bills necessarily. And I'm going to be honest, I'm a Keon Coleman guy. Mm -hmm. I know. Same. It's crazy. I'm, I'm a Keon Coleman guy. Uh, I still have a lot of faith in him. And when I am analyzing the picks that could be going after this, I do think the Chiefs could be a minute competitor or a minute suitor for Keon Coleman here because of the fact that I think with losing out on Mike Williams, he's going to be gone or Keon is going to be essentially the Mike Williams at pick 33. So I think that he's going to be going in this range anyways. If you need to select a wide receiver, do it. However, I'm going to go Byron Murphy. I don't think you can let the talent slip past. This team needs to have continuous interior pressure. And this is a guy who can be edge flexible. And I love that you just sometimes have to get the talent. He's 20 years old as well. So I'm going to bank on the talent and just go best player available rather than going after a position that I think would be more of a need. Okay. So I like the pick this this sets me up for Detroit. Uh, I, I do like the idea of them going Zach Frazier interior offensive line here, especially with Ooh. the loss of uh, Jonah Jackson in free agency to the Rams. Okay. But I think a player that they need to, uh, and, and the reality is, is Detroit also has, they have pick 61, they've picked 73. So they have three top 100 selections. They can go corner in either round. They can go interior offensive line in either in either round. Uh, I, I think the pick here would be a guy that I think really fits the Detroit mold. This might be a little bit surprising, might be a tad of a reach, but I think it would be corner Ennis Rakestraw Jr. from Missouri. Uh, I love the love the fit there, and the uh, selection ultimately came down to Rakestraw or uh, Zach Frazier would be the two that I was debating on. Now, do you want me to take Arizona here because that was the original pick, or do you want me... I have a plan. <laughs> okay. What's the plan? Uh, so, I, I, thought was, I had a plan too. When I made the, I had this, I had this whole plan when I, when I made the trade, you know what? Let's see. What, what's your plan? What's My, your plan? All right, I want to hear your plan. All right. Let me, let me cook. So the, 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 the so, thought process was we're going to move back three spots. We're going to pick up an extra three. Obviously Arizona needs a lot of help everything. on their football team. They need a lot of just better football players. The thought process was, uh, Baltimore does not need defensive line help because they have Justin Matabike. Right. He is one of the best interior defensive linemen in the league. Uh, Detroit also just signed DJ Reader. I didn't think they'd be going interior defensive line. Buffalo was kind of a toss up, but hey, look, if we can come out of the first round with an extra three and getting Marvin Harrison Jr. and Johnny Newton, that would be the plan. Pretty simple. Right. Johnny Newton to me is a top 15 player in this draft. And if you can walk out of the first round with him and Marvin Harrison Jr., I think Monty Ozenfort and uh, and company would be extremely thrilled with that. Absolutely, I'm gonna let it. I'm gonna go through with it. My plan. So originally, when we did that trade back, that was exactly what I was thinking. Yep. But I like to be a little bit more of a douche, and <laughs> I was looking at what the Niners. So, if you're fine with this, I'm I'm gonna play my plan out now. If sure. I were the Niners, I want Tyler Guyton to the Niners yep. because you have Trent Williams as. I assume that would be your pick as well. It would be. Yep. So we can essentially put that through. I was going to take Tyler Guyton for the Cardinals to give a good middle finger to the Niners and say, you thought you got this close to upgrading that right tackle spot. But Jerzon Newton is obviously the best player on the board. I just am a little bit of a stickler. So we ended off here at 32. There's a lot of good players that are still on the board. Welcome to the draft, everybody. That's what the NFL draft is. Like people fall good players fall i almost have an impossible time passing on nate wiggins uh you know just cerebrally speaking or mentally speaking he is almost cerebral he processes the game almost unlike every other corner that you see in the game and he's super well balanced between man coverage and zone a little bit on the lighter side but you know i think that's something you can take it or leave it uh defensive line wise i don't think that there's anybody remotely close to the value if jerzon newton were here i would say screw it i'm pairing him up with chris jones Receiver wise, you have Keon Coleman. I think I want to hear your thoughts on this because we can do almost a collab pick on this. I assume what you're going to be in the mood for more is a corner since Legere Sneed is gone. But I don't think there's a Keon Coleman frame on the roster. And I don't think there's a role for Keon Coleman that is exactly 
already set in stone in Kansas City that might be very unique. What are your thoughts on potentially Keon Coleman here? So, well, to answer the first part, I, I would take yeah. Nate Wiggins. You just traded Legereus Sneed. You need yeah. corner help. I think that's, I mean, yeah, I think that's the pick. But right. um, I would honestly, like if I were the Chiefs, I would kind of like let the, like the, you know, the early part of the second round play out. But the reality sure. is the Chiefs are kind of in the driver's seat. Like, hey, look, we we draft Keon Coleman. Great. Awesome. But we're still going to be fine regardless. I mean, I would love Keon sure. Coleman, but um, I, I still think, and I know just because what they're both big guys doesn't mean their play style is exactly the same. But if you can walk out of the draft with either Keon Coleman or Xavier Leggett in the second round, I would be fine with that. Um, I don't know if either are going to last two pick 64, but I don't hate the Chiefs trading pick 64 and then a three next year. Or even they also have the uh, the Titans third round pick in 2025 now because of the Legereus need trade. So hmm. I right here, I'd go Nate Wiggins. I wouldn't overthink that part, but I would I would wait and see how the uh, how the early to mid part of the second round would play out. And then I would probably go uh, Keon. I would probably try and trade up to get a guy like Keon Coleman because they do need to build their receiver room. And uh, Rasheed Rice and Marquise Brown aren't exactly the same profile as Keon Coleman is. Right. So I was on board with you again. Uh, Nate Wiggins was going to be the pick, but I was just super curious about yeah. it since obviously we're not continuing on for a second round um, as to the thought process of more even potentially even trading back and getting a big bodied receiver. So that's it. Thank you so much for coming on Garrett. It was obviously a blast, yeah. obviously being able to talk some ball. Obviously everybody who's watching, go check out his channel. His links are going to be in the description. Check out that quarterback's video because it actually is awesome. He uses real tape in it as well. So shout out to you for rolling the dice, <laughs> but give one more shout out to yourself and say goodbye to the peeps. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for having me. Um, you can check out my work, Football Analysis, and uh, hopefully you guys transition over. Hopefully, you know, you guys come through and uh, we're going to have a lot of prospect tape coming out. We have a Caleb Williams video. We'll have a Drake May tape out soon. So appreciate you having me on and uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed the mock. And uh, if you didn't, well, let, let them know in the comments. Helps with the algorithm. So definitely, definitely help. <laughs> definitely help my guy out. All right. Well, I appreciate it, Garrett. Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you on the far side.